Good morning. Wasn't that incredible worship? Thank you. Can we thank our leaders for getting us ready to hear God's word? You know, there are questions that uh, your life you just ask and you keep asking. Questions like, I mean, I wonder if you've said these, like, what's for dinner? Or a parent favorite, are we there yet? I hope you're not asking this one. When will the preacher finish her sermon? Do you love me? Why, why, why? Questions are a really funny thing because they often point to something that is going on in the heart of the asker. There's more going on there. One day, a man came to Jesus and he asked a question. What do I need to do? Maybe that's a question you've asked. It's a question that every world religion wants to answer. What do I need to do to live the life of lives? To live the life I really want? To live the life I've meant for? What do I need to do? Well, there was this young guy, and from the Greek word, we know he's probably in his 20s or 30s. It was a guy who was a leader at the synagogue, and it was a guy who had a lot of money. But unlike most of the people who came to Jesus, um, he didn't come with a gotcha question. He wasn't trying to trap Jesus. He was actually a really good guy who was trying to keep the commandments and trying to live the right way. And here's what happened. A man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. And if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? It's an interesting conversation, this dialogue between Jesus and this young man. Jesus answers his question with a question at first. He says, good? Why are you asking me about good? You you can't be good. If you want to, and then he answers, if you want to live your life, the life of lives, keep the commandments. Now, the young ruler knew there were a lot of commandments, so he pushed He said, which ones? And Jesus names some of the 10 commandments, but honestly, maybe not the ones we would have thought he would have answered with. Where is Jesus going with this? But the man keeps pushing. I've kept all those. The man keeps pushing because he knows something in his life is missing. And he asks Jesus the second question. What do I still lack? I'm doing all the right things, but my life is still flat. I'm going through all the religious motions, and I look really good on the outside. I have money. I go to church, but I want more. Is this all there is, Jesus? Three out of the four gospels tell us this story between Jesus and the young man. And I love that Mark adds a line right before Jesus answers this last question. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Read that with me. Jesus looked at him and loved him. 
If you hear nothing else in this message, I want you to hear this. Jesus loves you. Jesus sees you and he loves you and Jesus wants more for you. See, Jesus loved this man enough not to leave him where he was because he didn't want him to just have a good life and miss out on what he was made for. Here's how Jesus answered. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. That's our series, follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, this was really not about the money. I mean, it, it was about the money. It usually is about the money in every circumstance. When people say it isn't about the money, it is the money, right? But there's more to it. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, I hate that word. If you want to be perfect, what did Jesus mean? It could also be translated complete or totally dedicated. Jesus said, if that's what you're after, go, sell everything, give it all away, and follow me. Now, it was about the money, but it wasn't about the money. See, it wasn't what he was lacking that he asked. It was what he had to let go of. See, money had his heart. Money was between this man and Jesus. It was his identity. It was what he followed. Now, one of the great things about being a pastor, and I found out being a mother of the bride, is you get to have the best seat at weddings. There's something really powerful about watching the wedding drama unfold. The bride comes down the aisle, arm in arm with her dad. And waiting up here is this groom who is smitten. You don't know what he's going to do. Is it going to be tears? Is it going to be laughter? Is it going to, what is it? But it's so special to get to see that so close. Often tease couples that there is only one thing between you and getting married. And that's the dad. I had the sweetest view of that at Anna's wedding. Here it is. You can see there is Mark in between Anna and John Paul. It's a beautiful moment. But Mark literally had to step aside if Anna and John Paul were going to be able to make their vows. And he did. There it is. He gave him a hug and he stepped aside. You can't have something in between you and Jesus. I mean, hear this. In the case of some things in your life, they won't get out of the way. They will push Jesus out. They won't lead you to Jesus. In fact, they want to be Jesus in your life. Now, if that illustration was a little too sweet for you, here's another one. This happened in several games yesterday and will happen today, later, if you're watching NFL games. See, once an offense gets into the red zone, right, there is something between the offense and the end zone. What is it? It's the defense. And they will do anything, anything to keep the offense out of the end zone. What's in between you and Jesus? See, for this man, it, it was money. But that's not true. That's not the issue for everyone. In fact, if you look at all the places where Jesus says, follow me, rarely does he couple follow me with money. But in this case, that was what was between this man and Jesus. 
It was money. Now, look to the person on your left, look to the left. Look to the person on your right. Okay, they probably do not have the same issue that you do in between you and Jesus. I wonder what Jesus would ask you to get rid of. I wonder what's standing between you and Jesus. What are you following? See, this man, he knew something wasn't right. And that meant that God was at work in his life. In fact, if you have this sense of you're not satisfied and you're not happy and you don't know what it is, man, that's God's work in your life. God was at work in his life. He knew something wasn't right and he asked these great questions. What do I need to do? What do I lack? But he still tells Jesus, no. When Jesus tells him what to do, he says, no. And Matthew says, he went away sad. Now that's really a bad, weak translation if you look at that Greek word. See, I'm sad when Wake Forest loses football games, like yesterday, that happens a lot. I'm sad when my steak is overdone. I'm sad when it rains on Sundays because some people actually stay away from church because it rains. Not you, but some do. Really, this word is like grieved. He was grieved. It's the same word as the word when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying for God to take the cross away. He is grieved. This man is beside himself because he knows the stakes. And he knows that his good life really isn't that good. But he still walks away. We've been saying in the series that Jesus is still inviting people to follow him. He's inviting you to follow him. So, What does this story tell us about following him? Well, first, following is, following Jesus is demanding. It is, it's demanding. See, if you say yes to Jesus, you are taking anything between you and Jesus away. There can be nothing else between you and him. And Jesus won't settle for second place and he won't settle for sometimes. It's demanding and not everyone says yes. Following Jesus is also personal. We already discussed this. What your issue of following Jesus is and the person beside you, they're different. But when you come into the presence of Jesus in your life, when he is at work in you, Jesus sees through you. He knows your heart. He knows who you follow. He knows what stands between you and Jesus. Following Jesus is personal. And following Jesus is also a decision. See, you are following something in your life. You're following someone. And I think we have this account in three of the four gospels because Jesus wants to show us that there are times when people choose to say no. They walk away and they follow something else. Now, when you made your decision, if you've already done that, Maybe your decision was dramatic. See, you can do a dramatic yes or no. You can be like, mic drop, yes, Jesus, it's so clear. I need to get rid of this in my life and I need to come towards you. I need to follow you. But sometimes when you say no, it's not as dramatic as his. And it's also not dramatic. It's more like drifting 
So you can say a dramatic no or you can kind of just drift. You say yes, but not really. You keep letting things get in between you and Jesus. It's like death by a thousand paper cuts, right? They're little, but they, oh, they take your life. You can say no to Jesus just one little thing at a time. You vacillate. You follow when you want to, but you don't really decide. And there are too many things between you and Jesus, so you drift. I wonder if we could rewind the clock and you could be the one who was asking the question to Jesus that day. What would that look like for you? So you ask Jesus, what do I need to do? And then you started building your case. (laughs) Hey, I'm pretty good. I go to church most of the time. I try to be nice. I try not to run red lights or speed. I'm doing my best, Jesus. And if that's what your conversation looks like, I want you to hear the truth. Good won't get you the life you want. You cannot, there's nothing you can do on your own, not attending church, not giving money, not trying to do better and better. That won't get you there. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he gave his life so you could have your life. So it's really different than you might think. So what do I need to do? That seems like the right question. But the only way to have the life of lives is to respond to what God has done for you, to receive his grace and then follow. If you think you can do something on your own to get the life of lives, you are still following something else rather than counting on Jesus. But you come to a moment in your life when you meet Jesus and you have a decision to make. I mean, he's wooing you, he wants you, he's at work in your life. But you make a decision to make him first and follow. Or like this man, you know you you can't do it, you won't do it, so you walk away. See, as long as you're leaning on something else, as long as you're longing for something else, you're missing out. Something is between you and Jesus. I've been learning a lot lately from a writer named John Mark Comer. If you do not know him, you should. Start with the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It'll really get all over you. I was listening to one of his talks this week, and and this is what uh, I read, and it has been, it's stuck with me. And if you were at the women's uh, retreat, you heard me put this in front of you. Here's what it says. The paradox of Jesus' teaching is as long as you need your life to go a certain way to be happy and at peace, you will never be happy and at peace. Let that soak in for a minute. As long as you need your life to go a certain way to be happy and at peace, you will never be happy and at peace. See, Comer's getting at the same thing that this man is dealing with. Nothing else will give you the life of lives. Not a better job, not a bigger family, not a different spouse, not money. What Jesus is telling this man is, I am the starting point. I am the true north. And if you're waiting on other things to get you what you think you want, Jesus wants you to know it's him. Follow him because it's the only thing that will give you the life of lives. In Brazil, they they use a trap uh, to catch monkeys and it's called a kombuco. Maybe you've seen this before. 
It's very easy to make a kombuko. You put a hole in a gourd, just big enough for a monkey to put their hand in. And then you attach that gourd to the ground. And then the last step is to take a banana and put it inside the gourd. And it actually works. See, what happens is the monkey puts his hand to get the banana. That monkey wants the fruit. The monkey puts his hand in and and the monkey holds on. It is the most important thing. It's all they can see. They are fixed on the banana. They want the banana. They keep holding onto the banana. Banana. See, Jesus is saying to the young ruler, you have to let it go. If you don't let it go, you can't have me. And you're going to miss out. Your life will always be lacking. It's like if you're on a trapeze swing, you know, you have to let go to get to the other trapeze swing. You have to let go to get the adventure and the life that you can only have with Jesus. Larry Waters was looking for something more. At 13 years old, he had seen some weather balloons at a military supply shop, and he thought, ah, I could take those balloons and I could fly. And his whole life, that's what he thought about I want to fly. He worked hard and he wanted to be in the Air Force and he dreamed of doing that so he could fly. And his hard work came crashing down. It was a dead end because his eyesight wasn't good enough to be in the Air Force. So he became a truck driver. But he never stopped thinking about flying. His life wasn't enough. He wanted more. So years later, in 1982, he decided he would do it. He forged a requisition at his business, and he went and he bought 45 weather balloons. He told them he was going to use them for a television commercial. And then one July morning, he attached those balloons to his lawn chair, his favorite one from Sears. And he put on a parachute And he got some sandwiches and a beer and a a pellet gun. And he started flying. And he became known as Lawn Chair Larry. He got up to 16,000 feet. And he ended up flying into the Long Beach Airport aerospace, which was illegal. He flew for about 45 minutes and then he shot a few of those balloons and he got lower but then he dropped the pellet gun. And so he had to go for a long time and he finally got tangled into a power line and he climbed down to safety. Lawn chair Larry. But the big question that everyone wanted to know as he was being arrested was why'd you do it? Why'd you do it? I said, well, I wanted more. I wanted more. I, I just had to do it. If I hadn't have done it, it would have driven me crazy. Lawn chair Larry spent his whole short life looking for something more. You know, you can try all sorts of things. You can try to be good. You can try to be smart and and figure it out. You can do all sorts of crazy things looking for the life that you long for because you know that something is missing. Maybe you've done some crazy things on your own. But that day, a young man came to Jesus looking for more and he already had a lot he had money he had power he was really really 
good. He even knew who to go to. But it wasn't enough. And that day he made a decision to walk away. My prayer is that you will hear Jesus' invitation. That God will be at work in your life and you will hear that invitation. And by the Spirit, you will make a decision. You will say yes. You'll receive his love and his grace. You will get rid of anything in your life that is between you and Jesus. And you will say yes. And you will follow. Do not settle for less. Lord Jesus, what an invitation you give. Pray that every person hearing this message will hear your invitation, Jesus, to follow you. And Jesus, would you help us to let go? Would you help us to surrender? Would you allow us to give every part of our life to you would you allow us to get anything that's between us and you out of the way take our lives Jesus and help us to follow 